The unilateral or single leg box squat is a fairly challenging exercise for strength, stability, and power. There are generally two forms to this exercise. One, referred to as the pistol squat, requires the subject to hold his free leg straight out in front of him. The second is the movement we'll review here, with the free leg hanging straight down. The advantage to doing this on the box is that a greater range of motion can be achieved without interference from the free hanging leg. So let's evaluate this position at the bottom of the squat. The obvious challenge is to be able to go down and up, and to do so without falling over. Maintaining balance during this exercise really isn't that easy because the base of support is relatively small. Obviously, his foot is narrower than it is long, so his real challenge is to maintain stability in the frontal plane. But he still has to focus on where his weight falls between his toe and heel. And if he does this movement correctly, he'll get that weight centered right over the instep of his foot. One of the mechanisms that our subject has to control the fore and aft position of his center of gravity is the placement of his arms. Here, he's using his arms as a counterbalance. And with minor up and down movements of his arms, he can make pretty subtle adjustments to his center of gravity and really control his balance. Now, with his line of gravity positioned over his instep, he'll push down into the box, creating a vertical reactive component which will move him back to the starting position. From this line of gravity, three joint torques are created. One at the ankle, one at the knee, and one at the hip. This is probably the most well-balanced position that we're likely to see. There are effective torques at each of the joints, with the most load occurring at the hip, and rightly so, because that's where are located the largest muscles in the lower body. This could be considered a very well executed movement, but there are some who may take exception to the forward position of the subject's knee. We could push his knee back, but that's going to affect the balance of loading across his joints. Let's take a look at how that can happen. Let's assume we can get the subject to push his pelvis backwards, which would align his knee over his toes. A secondary effect would be to move his center of gravity backwards as well, quite possibly beyond his base of support, which would make him lose balance. Outside of changing his body position, the only option that we have for stabilizing him would be to add a weight to his hands. The addition of weight anteriorly would effectively bring his center of gravity back over the center of his base of support and reestablish a stable position. But now, we've created another problem. With his body positioned backwards and his center of gravity over his foot, we've effectively moved his knee closer to the line of force and his hip farther away from the line of force. So we've decreased the torque loading at his knee and increased the torque loading at his hip, rendering this position basically a hip exercise. If our goal is to strengthen the muscles around the hip, then this is a perfectly suitable way of doing it. But if we're trying to create balanced work between the hip and the knee, then this method is going to fall short of that objective. So the problem is that we have a decision to make regarding the execution of a fairly difficult exercise. Since the form that we use will affect the balance of muscle activity and the ensuing strength development, we have to be very careful with our selection. But with an understanding of the basic principles of biomechanics, we can empower ourselves to make the right choice.